I want to talk about the role of external actors uh, and, and civil resistance movements. And this is a big topic, a complicated topic, an under-researched topic. And uh, I'm going to try not to lecture the whole time. There's so much to say. Um, so I want you all to just kind of interrupt when you want to interrupt. And I'll also open it, try to find some spots to open up for question and answer. Uh, but the first, <clears throat> the first point I want to make is simply make the argument, why does civil resistance matter? Why, if you care about what's going on in the world, <clears throat> and you would normally think these nonviolent movements mean nothing to me, why actually is that statement now wrong? Why, why, what is the argument that everyone should be caring about this and, and that it's actually in many people's self-interest to care about these movements, uh, states and NGOs and others to care about them, and why I would even argue you, you can no longer fully understand geopolitics and, and the world and the politics of various nations if you don't understand something about the power of ordinary people to make change. And then I want to look at forms of third party support. And this is a big long list that I'll go through quickly. There are many different kinds of third party actors, right? So there are NGOs, there are individuals. I mean, some companies in Silicon Valley want to do stuff. There are states, there are multilateral institutions, there's the UN. So there's all these different kinds of third party actors. And then there's, and then there's all these different kinds of third party support. And it's, it's uh, my organization is supporting some research now uh, on um, trying to look at what forms of support work and what circumstances directed to whom, provided by whom, and so forth. That's a very tough question to get at methodologically, uh, but we're supporting a two-year research project on that. So if we come back in two years, I might have some more answers for you. Now, if you have a third party that is convinced that, okay, civil resistance matters, I need to look at it, and there are all these different forms of third party support I can give, but is it legal? What are the legal implications of providing support? Is it even permissible? And then even if it's permissible, we'll get to point four challenges. Is it advisable? Is it the smart thing to do even if you could do it? What are the, what are the challenges, what are the risks? And then last, I'll throw out with a question mark some possible guidelines uh, for third parties to consider if they were going to provide some kind of support. So why are civil resistance movements important for external actors to understand? I have four points to make on this, and some of it is repeating yesterday. The first is that civil resistance movements are a major force in ending oppressive rule. And if you don't care about oppressive rule for its own sake, you can think of all the ills that are spawned by unaccountable government that, that brutalizes, marginalizes its people, um, whether they're global health risks, whether they are um, the, the, sometimes the fostering of uh, violent extremism or, or a whole range of other refugees, whole range of other implications of having uh, truly non-democratic, non-accountable and oppressive governments and civil resistance movements are a way to that those transform. So we saw yesterday the, the sort of top line number from Chenoweth and Stefan of success rates and we can look here at the graph and see that again, between 1900 and 2006, civil resistance movements had a 53% success rate of confronting uh, governments that were either, well, <coughs> ousting foreign <coughs> occupiers, getting self-determination or ending dictatorship, and violence had about half that rate, violent insurgency. And you can see, on the other hand, the failure rate of violent insurgency is much higher. We can look over decades and see from 1940 to 2006 here, the success rates are really deviating significantly. Um, this omits the recent data that Maciej uh, discussed yesterday where the rate of civil resistance has declined now to about 35%, but the rate effectiveness of violent insurgency has declined to about 8%. So you can still say it's vastly more effective, but pretty significant decline. And then when they end oppressive rule, um, they have a relatively high probability of leading to democratic gains. So this, did you show this graph yesterday, Mache? So you remember this from yesterday. I'll do a little repetition. Repetition can be good to internalize stuff. When you have a successful civil resistance campaign, you have a 57% chance of a democratic outcome in five years. So they looked five years after a transition to try to figure that out, because immediately after transition, you can't figure out what's going on. 
new election laws might need to be drafted. Uh, there's an interim government. It's really hard to know what the new political end state is going to be. So they looked five years after to try to get a sense of how is this consolidating, and that's what they found. And very interestingly, they found that when a civil resistance movement failed, when it failed, there was still a 35% chance of a democratic outcome five years later. That's pretty amazing. And I th what, what I take from that is that there's something in the DNA of these movements that contributes to democratic development. It creates new civic participation. It decentralizes power from a concentrated government to the population. Uh, it builds networks of trust. Uh, it builds civil society. It builds a lot of the social capital and political power that you would need to sustain any kind of democracy. And there's another study as well. Um, Macha, did you discuss this yesterday? Uh, an earlier study that I'll just talk about briefly uh, that echoes some of Chenoweth and Stefan's findings. This is by the organization Freedom House. They looked at 67 transitions from authoritarianism between 1972 and 2005. So about 33 years, 67 different transitions from authoritarianism. And what they found was, number one, that 75% of those transitions, they could say that civil resistance was a key factor in driving them. Um, number two, uh, in two thirds of those transitions led to high levels of freedom. So 64% they found, which is consistent with Chenoweth and Stefan's finding of 57% of democratic consolidation, so it echoes it. What they, also, they also then looked at top-down transitions that were driven by elites. Um, so, <clears throat> So, for example, peace processes where the elites come to a round table and there's not a lot of civic participation and let's see what the outcome is. And from that, they have only a 21% rate of democratic consolidation afterwards. And they also looked at, well, what happens when you have a civil resistance movement that w en engages in violence? And what they see is that the chance of major gains in freedom jump, uh, drop from 64% to about 20%. So again, violence, to echo what Tom said yesterday, and the part of resistance, it doesn't just decrease your chance of success, it decreases the chance of democratic consolidation. Now interestingly, they looked at one-sided violence, just regime violence against demonstrators who remain nonviolent, and they found that that actually didn't decrease the chance of a democratic outcome that much. So when you read a headline about, quote, violent protests, really important to understand who started the violence and, 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 and was it reciprocated? Is it two-way violence or is it one-way violence? That question is analytically very significant, but what you'll find when you read uh, news stories is it oftentimes doesn't distinguish. And so here's a graph just showing the findings. Again, so what are the chances of, quote, free society after a transition driven by civil resistance? That's the blue line. By a top-down, elite-driven process is the is the red line, and actually I think I said it was 21%, it's only 14%, and then civil resistance with some violence is 20%. This is a chance of a democratic outcome. This is a chance of a partly free outcome. You can see here is where the sort of elite-based negotiated transition tends to result in a partly free outcome, and then the not free, when you have a civil resistance movement that adopts violence is really when the not free outcome increases. Now there's this other piece to this as well, is the chance of civil war, which is quite significant. What Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stevan found is that a nonviolent campaign has a 28% chance, there's a 28% chance of a civil war erupting 10 years after a campaign ends. If you look at a violent campaign, it's 43%. That's not surprising. If there's been a war once, chances are there, the chances are higher that there could be a war again. But look at, look at Syria, 2011 nonviolent relapse, it falls into civil war. So there are very real risks here that I don't want to downplay. So from all of this, what can we say? We can say, well, if you have a country that is non-democratic, what's the best way for that country to get to democracy? If you look at this data, there's, no thing, there's nothing that's 100%. There are going to be spectacular failures in all, in all forms of transition. There are going to be failures in the civil resistance form, 43% don't consolidate. But if you look at comparative rates of, of comparative probabilities, it's not even close. A grassroots-driven movement comparatively has a much better chance 
of success than any other option uh, that at least has been presented here. And these are some of the major ones. Um, and at the same time, there are significant risks. So the lesson from this is it's complicated. Yes? Uh, what I keep trying to think about, again, coming from the, the violence, is it necessary perspective, mm -hmm. um, that these numbers, I, the quantitative is really good. I, I'm mm -hmm. sure the data it holds. But the qualitative is what I keep wondering about, is that in the cases where it has gone violent, was it necessary? And if it was, I, I can only imagine that the violence would continue, because they, there, there's almost a it, it, it'll increase and it'll escalate until the point where the system collapses, right? And, and, and then the peace talks start. But was that violence propagating or, or just continuing these stats? And sure. I, I think the quantitative might show it, but was the regime so bad that it needed that violence? Or was sure. Well, right? I mean, so let me give you two quick examples. Yeah. Um, so the first one uh, is South Africa where you had a nonviolent movement and, uh, and you had the Sharpeville massacre in what was it, six, 1964, where basically you had a lot of South African blacks, black people who were shot in the back as they were fleeing police. And, what, pardon? 76, Sharpeville. Sharpeville was 76? Okay, I thought it was earlier, okay. And so, or was that the Soweto uprising? Yeah. yeah. So, was sure, so, um, so you have, at that point, a shift. A shift, and, and they say, look, the, the state only understands the power of violence. We're going to be violent. We're going to win. We've got numbers. And what proceeded to happen, by my reading of history, was that the struggle did not make a lot of progress in the ensuing, let's see, 20 years, 15, 20 years. In fact, at one point, uh, this is based on a, someone I know, uh, the South African ANSI intelligence sent people to Vietnam to say, what should we do? We feel stuck. And the Vietnamese came back to them and said, what are you doing? You should be waging a nonviolent political war, basically. It's a political program of mobilizing people is going to help you a lot more than going right into the teeth of a highly armed state. And it's the political program where you can really win. And so, and <clears throat> You know, what you saw there in the 1980s was the ANC never renounced the right to use violence. They even kept the iconography of the gun. They would either be, you know, sometimes people would bring sort of mock guns to protest. But the driving force of that struggle became nonviolent in the 1980s. And I would argue that when it became nonviolent, it also made it a lot easier for international companies and states to also get behind it. Uh, it could no longer be labeled as a terrorist organization. Trade unions got involved. Suddenly, they were imposing real costs on, on doing business. And so you could argue, well, the South African government was absolutely brutal. We look in retrospect and say, well, maybe it wasn't. It was. And it, a lot of times, at the time, something seems really brutal. And then it falls, and you say, well, maybe it wasn't that hard. It was really hard. Um, but that's one example where you could make all the arguments about we have the right to do this. Uh, but it, practically, it simply didn't work. Um, another example would be Syria, where I'm not going to criticize any Syrian who felt that they needed to pick up arms and fight Assad. I've not walked a mile in their shoes. Um, Assad was quite brutal. But as an outside observer of that conflict, I would argue that the Assad regime between March and about August, September of 2011, this is like a 40-year family dictatorship, was shaken much more than at any other time in 40 years by a sustained nonviolent challenge. And when that challenge became armed, they knew exactly what to do. And it reinforced all the loyalties, particularly ethnic loyalties, that they had. The, the, the dynamic of civil resistance is one of defection. So here you have a movement. Actually, the movement should be bigger. Here you have a movement. Here you have a government, for example. It could be a corporation. It could be whatever. We'll put government. And so the movement is continuing to try to pull the outer rings, often the outer rings, of the government closer. If you look at a particular pillar of the government, you could say security forces. They're trying to pull the, the enforcers on the street closer. But you guys are actually taking the risk. The guys giving the orders aren't. You guys have to face this every day. You don't get paid well. You're taking all the risk. And you've, you've, you've sworn an oath to protect the country. And we're here to actually say that this, this guy who's been running this country is like a foreign occupier. He's corrupt. He's a crony. He's stealing from all of us, including you. 
So it's a sustained operation to try to get defections. The minute they start firing and threatening, these guys go real close, they start obeying orders a lot more closely. Because at that point that they're being fired on or threatened, it doesn't matter how bad this, this person is in the center. This is life or death. This is just your training kicking in, right? And so the minute you start, the minute a movement starts to reverse this dynamic through violence, it runs the risk of unwinding all of this progress that it's made, and it's engaging the opponent where the opponent is strongest. Now, you could argue in some cases, like genocide, like Rwanda, what would they do? I don't know. But even there, there are actually cases of, which maybe Mache can discuss uh, later, he knows more, um, of resistance, even in genocides, that have actually not stopped the genocide, but saved people's lives. There was, a lot of, there was some of that in Norway, in Denmark, under Nazi Germany. There was even that, some of that in Berlin among Germans. Um, so anyway, we can get into more of that later. That yeah. a lot of my concerns. Great. All right. So, the third point. Civil resistance movements can play a critical role in reducing corruption. Thank you, Shaska, for your valuable research. I can now make that point. And I even have you in the room. So if someone challenges me on this point, talk to Shaska. <laughs> um, here are some quotes that I have shamelessly taken directly from Shaska's book, with credit to her. Uh, the in International Anti-Corruption Conference, which is a you know, forward-looking conference on, 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 conf on addressing corruption. In 2010, one of their uh, points at the end of their conference was basically, the next conference, we're going to look at the role of ordinary people in combating corruption, because top-down approaches by themselves aren't working. So here's, here's a line from their sort of final report, empowered people create change. This expanded element of our conference points the way to the, for the future of the anti-corruption movement, one incorporating citizen mobilization and empowerment, as well as the inclusion of youth. And in 2012, their conference, their theme was called Mobilizing People, Connecting Agents of Change. They know a lot more about corruption than I do, and they've concluded that unless you involve ordinary people in identifying it, imposing costs to reduce it, you can't do it top down alone. You have Transparency International, one of their six major international NGO uh, confronting corruption. This is one of their six strategy points from 2015. For ultimately only people can stop corruption. And then you have even the World Bank, two World Bank presidents making statements about the, um, the regressive power of corruption and the fact that citizens are needed to fight it. And here we have Shaska's book, which I highly recommend you read. It's fantastic. And I would point something out as well. There's a, actually, I'm going to zoom ahead for a second because I think it's relevant. Um, there's a quote from US General John Allen I want to share with you. Um, about corruption, where is it? We're gonna be here until these slides are all. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, all of them. Okay. Um, tch, tch, tch. There we go. So he was, General John Allen was testifying before Congress saying, we know that corruption still robs Afghan citizens of their faith in the government and that poor governance itself often advances insurgent messages. There's a woman named Sarah Chase who makes the, who makes the wrote a whole book about how corruption drives violent extremism. So corruption's not just some incidental thing that's just pesky and we'll get rid of it next year. Violent, corruption is one of the things that backslides any kind of progress you have, whether it's on human rights, uh, human development, or anything else. It's major. And civil resistance can play a major role in it. Um, And then the last point, and then I'll get on, get on with it, is that by, by creating disruption of unaccountable political systems and confronting corruption, they get rid of a lot of these sort of collateral ills that are embedded in corrupt and unaccountable political systems. I've listed some there. And so I have here a, a rudimentary diagram of sort of root and interlocking causes that are extremely difficult and persistent to get rid of. And there's no doubt that many approaches are needed. Many approaches are needed to deal with these. 
a lot of approaches that have been tried are top-down approaches, and that engaging with movements, engaging with citizens, or uh, trying to create an enabling environment for citizens to also play a critical role in these is extremely smart, extremely forward-looking. Civil resistance is part of the solution, and it's, it's probably the most underestimated part of the solution for a lot of those root causes. All right, so some forms of external support. Let me, let me race through these. Um, just two broad points. You, if, you're, if you're doing research, you could put them on a continuum, for example, of uh, indirect forms of support and direct forms of support. That indirect would be something like helping to build institutions and you know, uh, documenting certain you know, practices and rating governments. Uh, and direct would be, you know, for example, um, directly helping a certain particular movement in certain particular ways. Likewise, you could put them on a continuum of less interventionist um, to highly interventionist, you know, directly parachuting in resources and so forth. So what are some forms of third-party assistance? Let me draw from you all. Throw some out. What can states, INGOs, and others do? Yeah. So there, there's, a, there's actually a great example of this is uh, in the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, when they created the alternative taxi system of just regular civilian cars taking people, uh, the business, the, the city council said, you're running an illegal business, we're gonna shut you down. And they, they couldn't really do it, so what they did is they got insurance companies to stop insuring all of the vehicles that were doing the alternative busing. And it was a British insurance company that came in and said, we will insure these vehicles. And so that's an example, actually, of services being provided one other point. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. So we have lots of different kinds of material support. Direct funding, equipment, translations, uh, food or medicine, strike funds can be incredibly important, um, services, press coverage, information gathering and documentation can be really important. Human Rights Watch does a lot of that, for example. Knowledge and skill sharing. This is just a partial list of skills and knowledge that may be usefully uh, developed um, through some kind of collaboration. Providing meeting space, internet access, and libraries. There's um, a man by the name of Mark Palmer, he's now deceased, he was uh, President Reagan's uh, ambassador to Hungary, and he wrote this uh, book along with uh, Jeremy Kinsman, who, what's, Jeremy's Canadian, do you know what his, his background was? No. He was the ambassador to, do, you, do we know? He's a sociology student from the department in which I taught. <laughs> <laughs> and also a sociology yeah. student, also happens to be a former Canadian ambassador, and he and um, Mark Palmer and a man by the name of Kurt Bessiner um, who's in Bosnia, uh, wrote a book called The Diplomat's Handbook, where they talk about all kinds of things that diplomats and consular personnel can do to support the grassroots. Um, and it's, it's interesting, because you can't have an ambassador running their own foreign policy. They have to take orders. But they can do things like potentially open their embassy up as a space for people to meet, provide a secure internet line, provide libraries. They can do certain small things that can make a significant difference. Providing contacts, uh, uh, activists learn very well from each other, providing transnational contacts with other activists or to lawyers or others, advocates, media. Uh, Nonviolent peacekeepers and protective accompaniment. Does anyone know anything about this? Peace Brigades International, Nonviolent Peace Force and others. Does someone want to say something about it? Yeah, yeah they essentially by their presence with the person, they protect them from being you know, shot or the right, and so these are these are people um, who will go and nonviolently be protect human rights defenders or whole communities from attack. As basically, if you attack this community, we might get killed, uh, which will create an international incident. In addition to the fact that we will be reporting and watching, and it's it's. How about that? That's great. Right, and there's a man by the name of Randy Jansen at Selkirk University or college? College. college who has created a data set of nonviolent uh, 
uh, what is it, with the unarmed civilian protective accompaniment um, of cases around the world and really interesting to look at how effective it is. Uh, attending trials and demonstrations. Ambassadors can show up. Others can show up. Members of NGOs can show up. Um, making public statements of support, public condemnations, offering asylum, lobbying allied governments. Um, we know that uh, if a government that supports, uh, can I put it? We know that when uh, you have an authoritarian government that's being challenged by a movement and other governments begin to pull their support from that authoritarian government, that that can have a significant impact. Uh, serving as intermediaries uh, to try to negotiate. Targeted sanctions, there are different kinds. Um, freezing assets, travel bans, exclusion from meetings, broad economic sanctions. Uh, pressing for movement objectives and negotiations, and there are different kinds of negotiations. And I have here uh, a paper from the Helsinki Accords, which were ratified in 1975. I know we have people here who know more about the Helsinki Accords than I do. Um, does someone want to say what they were for a second? Because I think they provide an interesting example of how third party support, which I don't even think was conceived of as supporting movements, actually, I would argue had a very significant effect. Someone want to say something? John. Yeah, they were a diplomatic agreement between the Soviet Union and Western powers. And what the Soviet Union got out of it, the, the boundaries wouldn't be changed by force here. But on the other side, there was an agreement to protocols to respect uh, human rights and uh, right of free speech, and even right of the press and all that. And so that led to the uh, formation in the Soviet Union of the Helsinki Monitoring Group to, to see if the Soviet Union was living up to the uh, core. Yep, exactly. And so it was a. Uh it was a 10-point agreement um, and, uh, between Brezhnev and Ford in 1975. It was signed by 35 different states. And basically what the Soviet Union got was recognition uh, that the Baltics were part of their borders. It was finally sort of acceptance that, OK, we, we won't contest that. On the other hand, and so that was a real politic victory that Brezhnev could bring back. The borders got recognized, hey, we, this is now formally recognized as part of us. And in return, on the other end, there were a bunch of assurances that weren't very real politic. There's sort of say soft guarantees of the right of people to determine their own future, uh, human rights, that okay, uh, national borders are inviolable, but if people choose a different way, they can, and that was signed off on. And it didn't rise to the level of treaty, but it was still a significant agreement. And this led to monitoring. This led to uh, as, as John said, the Helsinki Commission, it led to uh, ultimately what became Human Rights Watch came out of um, this as a monitoring body, which was really interesting. So you had an agreement here that created a framework that provided a certain amount of political space for people to become more active. And I would definitely not argue that Kissinger and Ford were thinking about movements, particularly when that agreement was signed, but it, it created what we call an enabling environment. And I think it's a great example because if you, I mean, I say this in the US all the time, you know, human rights is stated as one of the US values, think of that what you will with regards to foreign policy. But it, you know, it, it gets trumped frequently for trade or military or any other, you know, countering violent extremists, all other kinds of cooperation, human rights can quickly fall to the bottom of the list. And we have this great example from history here that when you create an enabling environment as a third party, not based on any particular movement, but just we believe that when rights are respected, movements can catalyze that space. You get a really interesting outcome. There was no, there was no at the time understanding of how things would transition out of the, the Cold War state that they were in necessarily. People had different views of it. But I don't think a lot of people thought that it would end nonviolently with movements. And so sometimes when states get caught in a very binary relationship as the US has been in with Iran, with Egypt and others, movements have a potential to break that binary sort of issue of do we engage or do we condemn? Do we bomb or do we negotiate? All of that stuff. Uh, movements can change that whole game. And as I say that, I want to be really clear. External third parties can't catalyze movements. They can't, they're not chess pieces. Nonviolent revolution is not exported. <laughs> 
said yesterday, there's a science, but there is no formula. It's local initiative that drives these movements. Ukrainians don't show up in Maidan Square in December by the hundreds of thousands risking their life and in cold temperatures because some third party put them there. They do that because that, that's, their, that's their country, that's their stake. Some movements work, but understanding that environments can be created where that becomes easier and more possible is an important insight to take. Um, cultural, academic, and economic boycotts. Uh, you've seen, uh, talks about boycotts of Israeli settlement products, divestment from Sudan, South Africa. Um, there's an interesting example from the Maldive Islands uh, where, uh, you know Lonely Planet guides? Does anyone know Lonely Planet? So, so the Maldives is a, is a nation of 300,000 people south of uh, Sri Lanka and the major industry there is tourism. And a lot of the resorts uh, were basically in the control of a very small family that had run the country for uh, 30 years. It was one of the longest standing dictatorships in the world. And, Lonely Planet, with the, from the, with, because of advocacy, said, okay, we're gonna come up with a list of resorts you can go to that are not tied to the government. So it's a very selective, targeted boycott where it's like, you wanna go there, fine, just don't feed the coffers of the corrupt ruling regime. Uh, economic and diplomatic engagement, pressuring other third parties to withdraw support, rewards and safe havens for defectors and whistleblowers. This is, sometimes gets more attention these days about should a fund be created for defections from bureaucracies or uh, government or military or security forces? Should there be some kind of you know, guarantee of asylum, uh, possible cash, and so forth? I don't really have an opinion on any of this at the moment, but it's, this stuff gets discussed. Um, establishment of odious debts is the idea of basically saying that if debts were incurred by a government under dictatorship, those debts will not be honored because they weren't given with the, they weren't taken with the consent of the people. Um, I don't know that that's ever been done, but it's been explored as an idea. And if you want, there's lots of other ideas you can find at the outsidersguide.org. Yes? Uh, the follow-up comment on uh, Gentleman's uh, comments about Crimea. Uh, about a week and a half ago, we had the opportunity to have a uh, film crew visit the military college in Kingston. Uh, they just finished filming a documentary about the fighting at Donetsk Airport mm -hmm. uh, in the east end of the Ukraine. So while that's not happening in Crimea, make no mistake, there is still violent armed conflict motivated by Russian encroachment on Ukraine's territory. I mean, Crimea was occupied by conventional military forces from Russia, so it's, it would be suicidal to mount you know, civilian offensive against that type of military strength, but that doesn't mean that there isn't violent resistance taking place in response to the, the encroachment in other parts of the country where the uh, enemy, if you will, is not necessarily the conventional Russian military. Sure, sure. And when I say is you know a civilian-based component of defense policy. I would, I would never say that it would be an assault like, you know, come up to soldiers and who are ready to fire. It's much more of a subtle form of non-cooperation. If you look in World War II, for example, you had Danes uh, as well as Norwegians who under Nazi occupation simply refused to follow orders. They, they would delay, sabotage, and um, sometimes just flat out refuse in subtle ways that drove up the cost of the occupation significantly. For example, um, the Nazis were never able to institute their education policy in occupied Norway because teachers just wouldn't do it. And so there, there are some ways of driving up the cost that still keep the risk very low. Um, so anyway, it's an interest, it's a, whole other, it's a whole other angle that can be discussed. And your point about the ongoing violent uh, fighting is absolutely well taken. Um, but maybe Maciej can speak to that a little more later since he has, he has thought more through those issues than I have. Um, Okay, so we know civil resistance is important. We know there are lots of ways external actors can engage, but is it legal? Is it permissible? And there are plenty of international treaties. I've listed some there, some of the major ones, um, that really say clearly that people have the right of freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of conscience, uh, freedom, or. Uh, rights of political participation uh, that would arguably, quite convincingly in my opinion, would include many acts of civil resistance. Civil resistance is covered uh, 
under existing human, international human rights law. Assembly, conscience, expression, a lot of these encompass a whole a huge array of nonviolent methods of contention. And you could argue that the nonviolent methods of contention are both an expression of those rights as well as guarantors of those rights. Your right of political participation can be taken away if you don't have means to nonviolently resist. So there's, so, so there's a pretty strong argument there that civil resistance itself, even if disruptive, is quite well covered under international human rights law. Uh, I've listed some treaties here, some general assembly resolutions you can reference as well, some international institutions that are supposed to monitor these treaties um, that have all made statements that are pretty clear. Uh, they don't use the term civil resistance, um, but it's pretty clear what is covered. Um, <clears throat> I have here some quotes as well to support that. Here is uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly and Association, Mina Kiai. Uh, the right of freedom of association not only includes the ability of individuals or legal entities to form and join an association, but also to seek, receive, and use resources, human, material, and financial from domestic, foreign, and international sources. Freedom of association means nothing if I have the right to associate with you, but you don't have the right to associate with me, right? It's reciprocal, it goes both ways. You can't say, well, you have the right to say, but that person can't associate with you. It goes both ways, and it transcends boundaries. Here you have a quote from uh, the scholar Elizabeth Wilson, uh, which I'll read. The primary right to engage in nonviolent protest implicates political participation rights, the rights to opinion, information, and expression, the rights of peaceful assembly and association. The right to receive information is transitive, that means it goes both ways with respect to the right to impart information. The right to associate with those willing to provide support is transitive with the right to associate with those who wish to receive support. Nonviolent actors are protected by the right of self-determination, the right of peaceful assembly, and various political participation rights. So again, we have a pretty clear argument here that civil resistance is covered and that certain kinds of assistance to civil resistance movements, information exchange, some would argue exchange of material resources, would be covered. Uh, but you know, it's the law, it's complicated, there's issues of time, place, and manner. Um, and then I just have a few direct uh, quotes here, which you can read yourself from the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. I would also point out, if I may, that actually going back for a second, one of the reasons why governments, and again, I've seen it with democratic governments too, as well as non-democratic governments, label movements as terrorists, as foreign-backed agents and everything, is I, I would argue to try to get them out of this human rights framework. They're not really exercising their human rights, they're dangerous, they have every intention of, of being violent, they're doing real harm to people, and they, they're trying everything they can to implicitly get out of these legal rights protections by their framing of nonviolent dissent. And so the non-intervention, um, Norm, I'll, I'll say a few things about it. So one thing that people may not know is that it was originally codified in the UN Charter as meaning you're not allowed to use force against other states, violent force. That was the original codification. Um, one person I was speaking to said there was actually a carve out um, going back a long time for exchange of information saying it was fine because uh, back before computers, books were a primary way that information was exchanged and it was actually saw as a really good thing. Exchanging information was never seen as a violation of non-intervention, for example. Um, some will interpret non-intervention more broadly and there's some grounds for that. I'm not saying that it's a totally clean cut case. It's an argument. Um, but the original encoding of that was about the use of violent force. And the original intent of non-intervention was to actually support the self-determination of people living in a country. So you can't intervene in this country violently because you're screwing up the right of the people in that country to determine their own way. Now what happens if you have a government that gets no democratic consent from its people, doesn't hold elections or steals them all the time, has no, has no interest in decades and allowing self-determination of their own people. They're completely in violation of, of the right of those people's self-determination, political participation. What if you have external support then that is nonviolent that aims to actually invigorate the ability of those people to engage in self-determination? Do you see where I'm going with this? Mm 
you could make the argument that external support in some cases is actually consistent with the right of self-determination and does nothing to violate the norm of non-intervention. In addition, to be able to, uh, to assert sovereignty uh, begs the question of where does sovereignty come from? Does sovereignty inherently lie in a head of state? Well, it doesn't matter how I got here. It doesn't matter how long I'm here. I'm the head of state. I'm sovereign. That argument is fallacious, and it doesn't have a basis in law. Because sovereignty resides in the population. And so it's the people, it's the citizens who are actually sovereign, and they give their sovereignty, or they, they allow, through elections or other processes, sovereign to be, sovereignty to be asserted by making their voices heard. When that process ends, how is it that a dictator gets to assert sovereignty and claim sovereign immunity, sovereignty and you can't do anything here when the people haven't given them the right, the ability to do that? It's an arbitrary assertion because it's very clear that sovereignty resides in people. Furthermore, sovereignty is a flexible concept. Uh, we have, there is a, you know, a doctrine of responsibility to protect, which clearly says that when atrocities are about to be committed um, that meet certain criteria, there can be external armed violent intervention. We all know that sovereignty can become porous depending on the degree of abuse and violations uh, by a government of their own people. So the idea of sovereign as an ab absolute wall is not, is, is not accurate anyway. And the, the thought that a leader could assert it without any kind of legitimacy from its people is also not accurate. And then, of course, there are contradictions in practice. So there's two sources of international law. One is treaty and the other is customary. Customary is based on practice. And so some of the states that are most concerned about their sovereignty being violated are ones that blatantly violate other sovereignty through armed intervention, right? And in practice, the, the, the precedent they're setting is actually much broader for their rights to intervene wherever they want. Um, so that is another argument to say, you know, sovereignty, it's not that it doesn't matter, it's not that non-intervention doesn't matter, it's not that, um, it's not, uh, that those are meaningless concepts, not at all. It's just to say you can't close the case by asserting those things and saying, therefore, human rights stop at our borders. To do that is to say human rights are nothing more than words written on paper. And so there's an argument that needs to be had about this. And I, I don't see it being had sufficiently uh, these days um, because I think that the, the increasingly uh, a, quite a few states are very clear in sort of singing from the same, same sort of book about how civil resistance is not protected by human rights and how there's absolutely no right to assist it. They're all in unison on this. And on the other side, I don't see a kind of coherent response to say, actually, that's not true. And so m my thought is, well, it's not, I didn't create this thought. I, I drew it from other people um, in my organization, is that there, there needs to be a conversation about something called the right to assist. There's a responsibility to protect. It's controversial. It allows people, it allows states under certain circumstances to do violent intervention. Why should there not be a right to assist in certain nonviolent ways when people are having their rights violated? Why should that not be a doctrine? Why should not, that not be out there? It's, it's, so anyway, I think it's a, it's, it's a conversation that I hope picks up. Now, challenges of external support, there are many. So even if we just talked about what's permissible, yeah. Bog us down. To play devil's advocate, yep. from, a, from a military perspective, because the, the right to protect or responsibility to protect, depending on how you want to phrase this, is something that we, we deal with a lot. And um, while it, it definitely implies you know, violating country's sovereignty, whether justified or not, and has often involved violent action, one of the benefits is that, of course, we maintain a degree in which of control of what happens with that intervention, and how would you respond to the challenge that assistance, if it doesn't involve sending in troops or aircraft or whatever, means that we're surrendering some control of what's done with that assistance? Because of course, even if the movement starts out as nonviolent, then 
there's no guarantee that it'll remain nonviolent. I mean, that's what we hope, but if it doesn't, then just by assisting, we're letting whatever group we're assisting maintain all control and use whatever resources we give them. So how, how would you respond to that? I, I would say that you're right, that you, that's exactly right. If you're supporting movements, the movements are gonna do with that assistance what they will, and that is very challenging for some external actors to accept. Um, the, the, the model is funding or material support for a clearly defined organization, not a broad range of support for a particular possible, there's organizations in the movement, possibly there aren't. I mean, lots of places, there's no civil society official organizations that could receive it. And so there is giving up a degree of control. I would argue that's, actually, that's how it should be as well because to the extent that a movement is seen to be controlled by an external actor, the legitimacy of that movement could plummet, absolutely drop. When the legitimacy drops, the volunteer base dries up and then you don't have a movement anymore anyway. But my argument to you all is this, it's a process-based argument. If we go back to the probabilities, if we go back to the probabilities of transformation of a given society, you were said, okay, which, which probability is highest? By my reading of the data, it's not even close. So if you really want to, to, um, to see some kind of change, because there could be all kinds of regional instability or other, you know, let alone let's say that human rights isn't even foremost in your mind of concern, just regional instability or other things that are affecting you, could affect you, that <clears throat> movements are the best way out of that. Um, but it's, there's a certain act of faith, it's a process, there's a chance it could lead to civil war, as it has, but there's a pretty good chance that it will lead to something better. And we all know that in, you, you can't really evaluate something that's the perfect, you've got to evaluate it only against other options. So, Tom, were you gonna say something? <clears throat> yeah, only that um, it should, in my view at least, never be the province of any one country to uh, assume that responsibility to protect. It should be a United Nations function. Right. Uh, and it should not, it, it should always be boots on the ground never uh, just this air war like, like we see now, and it should absolutely never be uh, surrogate and proxy troops because then you lose 100% of the control that you, you, uh, that you supposedly had uh, if you're gonna use violence. Yeah. The other thing is that states are a pretty, it's a pretty blunt instrument to try to be helping a movement if you're a state. And so a lot of forms, ways that states could help would be indirect, would be something like the Helsinki Accords that I mentioned earlier, be something about broad statements about human rights or condemnations. Um, you know, there's uh, Admiral Dennis Blair uh, the, from the United States has written this book where he says that because the U.S. has so many points of contact, U.S. military with militaries from around the world because they attend our war colleges and join exercise and so forth, we should be keeping track of which officers know officers in other countries, and those officers can call them and advise restraint they, when, they're, they do, they do when there's a nonviolent challenge. Yeah, and that this should be done more systematically. That's a very oblique form of support, not tied to any form of movement, um, any, any particular movement, which I think, you know, military support to a nonviolent movement is going to contaminate it terribly. Uh, but, but advising restraint on the part of officers who you were in staff or war college with is a different thing. One other comment, and then, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> From my perspective, it's a very sensitive topic. I mean, the problem of external support. You know, there's uh, two different issues. One is the relations with the domestic government, and it's more or less uh, a political and legal issue. The other is relation to the public uh, opinion. If if it is because there are different uh, uh, public attitudes towards the different. Uh, um, mm, civil resistance and resistance actions. I, I, from my point of view, uh, this is one of the important uh, criterion, I mean the uh, uh, attitudes, domestic public uh, opinion towards this uh, uh, particular uh, resistance actions. Mm -hmm. If it is uh, widely supported by public, by domestic public, definitely I think it would be more or less legitimate to support uh, uh, by external uh, actors, regardless uh, uh, um, regardless uh, position of the domestic government. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it is problematic.
I think that's a very good point. And so, so you, this gets to the critical issue of legitimacy and the fact that external support can do more harm than good. And, and particularly if their action's not popular already. And the thing about external actors though, interestingly, is a lot of times they don't even think about support until there's a movement that is popular, which maybe is good news. Like in the case of South Africa, sanctions came when there was a movement that was clearly nonviolent and really making progress. But you're absolutely right. And, and even well-intentioned support, like, oh yeah, let's, let's get some money to this group. Money? Money can destroy a movement really fast. How is that money absorbed if there's no structure to absorb it? Who manages it? Could there be accusations of profiting? I mean, movements have, have crumbled because of well-intentioned money. So th there are a lot of issues in addition to legitimacy. I'll go through a few of them. Um, yeah, no. I, I, I just wanted to follow up on what, uh, what Leon said. Because, you know, it, it certainly is a strong argument. You don't want to uh, support uh, a group, with a, a dissident kind of group, within a country if, there's, if it's an unpopular, if public opinion goes against it. But that is precisely the the logic that enables the government to really taint any kind of support that uh, outsiders do want to offer. It, it is, it, it's a kiss of death sometimes to offer support to a group that really should be supported. And that, I think, is the dilemma, what, what you do then. Some people make the distinction between uh, NGO or private support versus the government-funded support. So, for example, NED or any uh, uh, in, in Canada, CEDA or Foreign Affairs or something, would, uh, if, if they make a distinction between money that comes from the government and money that comes from private sources outside. But I don't know whether that even cuts any ice when it comes to uh, uh, influencing public opinion uh, within the country as to the legitimacy of, of that kind of support. Mm -hmm. I think this, that is a very troubling problem because there's so much uh, that's been done to say all you have to do is say this group is funded from outside and, and you kill them practically. Well, Even they, if you don't pa pass a law and throw them in jail for accepting it. And this is where I think, I think we need to really look beyond the idea of funding, which is a very old model. Funding is the vector organizations that target, and we're talking about movements, which may have organizations in them or may not. And funding, I don't, I don't think movements fail because of lack of funding in general. I think movements sometimes can create a grassroots base for their own funding needs. I would, put, I would say that, broadly speaking, if you look at three attributes of successful movements, you'd say one, unity. Two, they have good planning capacity. And three, they maintain nonviolent discipline. So external assistance, if you accept that, external assistance that can help develop, cultivate those attributes could be really important. For you could add a fourth one, which would be they have a plan for transition if they're in fact against a state, or they have a plan to consolidate their gains. Um, which I think there's a big role for external actors in potentially helping to consolidate democratic gains afterwards um, if it's against a state. Um, so, for example, my, my organization, our answer to this is we share information. We share information the kind of which you're getting at this seminar. We support translations. We support case studies uh, and, and getting them out there. We support research. We support programs. Um, we supported the Erica Chana with the Maria Steffens research, uh, their major quantitative study, because our belief is that a lot of this is skill-based. And if people build skills around these, especially in countries where the information environment's not free, and no one's getting educated about this, then that is a one particular value. It's just one form of support. It's very indirect. It's not tied to any particular movement. It's publicly putting stuff online, but it's, it's a way to accomplish perhaps one piece of things.
destabilize other countries' democracies. And I don't think that's something that we should forget. <laughs> um, because I think while um, countries go in and I think kind of market good intentions, um, there's been a lot of cases where, um, like they did like the V yesterday, uh, and uh, the coup d'etat against their democratically elected leader, completely destabilized Haiti all over again and kind of just threw them back into the conflict that they had kind of just brought themselves out of. Yep. I take your point very well. I want to I wanna say a couple things on it, but I'm going to take one other point. Yeah. Right. They don't want economic structural adjustment. Well, I think, so a couple points on this. I, of course, I agree that, that states have, look, states have interests, not friends. That's the, my general rule of thumb, okay? So uh, beware of states bearing gifts, you know? They have interests, not friends. And they're gonna try to influence for their objectives, period. And that doesn't mean that all states are monolithic. Tens of thousands of people work in the U.S. government. Uh, some of them have extremely good intentions. Some of them uh, have, you know, intentions that are maybe not, not as good or different. Some are ignorant of how to, I mean, there's lots, the states are not monolithic. Even within a given state, one agency might have, be trying to pursue one objective and another aspect, uh, element within the state might be trying to achieve a completely counter objective. They're huge. States are sprawling bureaucracies with their own interests and lots of different people. But your points are very well taken. I'm looking at civil resistance movements and particular forms of support to them. So there are plenty of cases where a movement wasn't particularly involved where states have done things um, that have been damaging. So I won't talk about that, I won't contest that, I think it's true. In the civil resistance context, here's what I see. I see over the course of the last 15 or 16 years a very, very sustained effort by governments around the world to roll back these movements. I'll give you a list on the next slide of ways. By trying to manage electoral processes and reduce political participation by limiting and shaping civil society, uh, labeling civil society as foreign agents, trying to crush them with bureaucratic requirements and filing and paperwork, which, you know, 100 pages of documentation, and if you make any mistakes, you can be brought up on charges and fined and put out of business jailing members of civil society, advocating a discourse of hyper-sovereignty, basically, which totally sort of, I mean, makes human rights uh, ineffective as, as an argument because we're hyper-sovereign, controlling information streams, sharing information, monitoring technology among themselves, provoking civil resistors to violence using provocateurs. You know, you have now youth movements set up by governments to try to squash civil resistance which gives the government plausible deniability by saying, hey, these are just our enthusiastic, youthful supporters that just happen to come in and beat people up. <laughs> Claiming civil resistors are a threat to stability and even military invasion in the case of Ukraine. That's what I see. And I see it picking up. I see that there's no level of repression and this kind of pushback that's gonna be satisfying. It's gonna keep going. And it's, it is aggressive, it's an aggressively pursued agenda that will keep going. It will never be satisfied. And for me, I don't think that the, what, you know, I've been in this field for, for a while, I don't think that the major issue that drives these movements to be effective is external support. And I even used to avoid this issue because I thought it was almost a distraction. Because it, there's no substitute for a movement on the ground that's indigenously driven. None at all. But I felt that I had to go into the thorny issue of external support and look at it and all of, the, all of the conflicts and difficulties and nuances that it has, which you're pointing out, because this is what I see on the other side. I see when a movement comes up, there is an array of states 
ready to try to block it and support each other. And on the other side, I don't see a coherent response. And I'm not just talking about states here, I'm talking about INGOs. I'm talking about multilateral institutions. I, I pretty much, I mean, I don't, I think in general, states doing direct support to movements, very risky. Perhaps some kind of, you know, transnational body could be set up that could be helpful, I don't know. It might call for new institutions. But to say that because of past practices in various countries that we should be, be cautious, absolutely. But to say that we therefore shouldn't engage, I think is a whole different level because a different side is definitely engaging. So it's, that's why I raise this more to try to create a conversation rather than to you know, give a declaration to you all. I would say that um, when people assert, well, this movement was driven by this government, and I, I'm only talking about nonviolent movements. Violent insurrection can definitely be driven and exported. But this nonviolent movement is a different thing. It works by different principles, it's different. And when someone says, well, this was clearly backed by the US, or this was, I really say, how? Can you explain to me the logical process that, by which that happened? I really want to understand how that happened, because my explanation is that ordinary people were really fed up from years of misrule. Um, <clears throat> they saw some, there was either a high, an incident that was triggering, uh, but hopefully planning before that so people knew what to do, or, um, or there was a small local campaign that built and gave people confidence and hope and people joined. And that that's why these people are taking time off of their jobs and taking these risks. Now what's your mm -hmm. argument for how these people are all somehow controlled by the United States? I'd like to hear it. And I've never heard an argument that makes a lot of sense about how ordinary people would mobilize in such numbers and take such risks. Does that mean that the US and, or other states aren't trying to do something? Absolutely, states go where they think they can have influence and they'll try to influence all kinds of things. They have interests. But the, the fact that different states are trying to jockey for position in a particular conflict is nothing new. That doesn't mean necessarily that a movement that's indigenously driven is somehow beholden to those states. So it's, anyway, distinction I would make. One, yeah. There's something also that I would call maybe donor disease, which is that when um, international actors, it can be in the development realm, but even in, in things having to do with civil society and human rights, they may like provide support to an NGO or a civil society organization or something. And then when, when that group does something amazing, they'll try to take all the credit. And they'll say, oh right. yes, we, you know, you know, we did this program with this group or something. Right. And they do that because they have to legitimize what they're doing for their home countries. But in fact, they were not the initiators or the protagonists of things. So I've seen that in the anti-corruption realm a lot. And we've seen it in the civil resistance realm, yeah. where you have a group that comes and says, I gave a training, and then it led to this movement. It's, it's like, false, but it helps them raise money for their NGO. Yeah. And yeah, on the, one other point on the, um, John, you mentioned Serbia. One of my friends is one of the founders of Otpor, and I asked him what the single most important uh, help he got was, and he said it was in the beginning of the struggle when we were able to meet with activists from Slovakia that had been uh, successful against the Mečiar regime, and they taught us what they knew. And so it was actually at the beginning, in collaboration with other activists, that they sort of got, that they developed a lot of sort of key ideas that, that were useful in their movements. So is external support of connecting one activist group with another activist group, is that too interventionist? It's, you know, th there's, lots of, there's lots of room for creativity and to, to think through these critical issues. I do feel that because of time, we should stop. I'll take maybe one last comment or question. Um, I just want to repeat, you're saying there's not really this much of like a direct effect in external support, but I think if you were to look at, say, the developmental aspects of external support, I think it can have a really big difference on how these movements uh, end up happening. Like the, uh, in Bolivia in 1999, there was the structural adjustment programs, and they, have, uh, they privatized water. And Cochabamba. Yeah, yep. it ended up being like this massive problem because people could already afford nothing and now they couldn't afford water. And it ended up like 
hitting a peak when one of our protesters was killed, but I think that never would have been sparked without these external influences, these structural adjustment programs. Sure. So I think there is a very direct way that the external actors can influence civil. Uh, so that, I, I love that point. It, the, so what I was gonna cover, thank you for that. What I was gonna cover uh, quickly was just talking about challenges, risks, loss of legitimacy, regime persecution, giving strategic advice which should not be done by third parties, building dependency, excessive influence, draining talent from movements by hiring them into NGOs, creating divisions in the movement. And then guidelines for effective support was my last slide, and the first one was first do no harm. So if you wanna figure out how to help Bolivians, perhaps don't privatize their water in the second largest city in Bolivia. And uh, though interestingly, in the case of economic structural adjustment, there are a number of Latin American countries where that's catalyzed a movement that has actually led to a total transition of, of party rule. Um, but first, do no harm. So I'll run through these real quick. <coughs> Consider indirect support. Supporting abroad, uh, you know, supporting human rights in general or anti-corruption in general rather than a particular movement. Listen to needs. Support local empowerment and ownership. You have to give up control, but trust a process. And the one place I would say where I think third parties can come in a bit more with, you know, an opinion on, on this is urging nonviolent discipline. It's extremely well documented at this point. I think, I think that at this point, for me, the debate is over, that there are enormous risks when a movement becomes violent, and I think third parties are totally fine pressing that line. Um, and then the last is when necessary to coordinate with other third parties. Uh, if people want to talk, about, talk more about this or have any referrals to books, come up and talk to me afterwards. Thank you very much.